Again, good morning. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have five grown children. My wife Pat and I are what you call empty nesters. I recall when our children were probably around the age of 8, 14 or 15, they made a decision on the type of people that would become the close friends to hang with through the peaks and valleys of their teenage years in high school. This behavior was not something that we mandated. It just sort of happened. And my two oldest sons ended up finding a whole new set of friends. They chose to lose their life to save it. You know, there's going to be conflict with teenagers. Friendships will be lost because some are living in the kingdom of God and others want to live in the pleasures and standards offered by the world. Once this becomes apparent in teenage relationships, there are some tough decisions and choices to be made, especially with peer pressure that often works in the way of these decisions. In the case of these two children of mine, the conflict meant losing friendships and building new friendships in their teens. Matthew 10, 39 says, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, referencing Jesus, will find it. My goal this morning is to help hearers understand that when Jesus came to live with human creatures, the kingdom of God, God arrives. And with it also arrives the judgment of God. There were promises and a warning that came with it. Our promises lie in the part of the kingdom of God. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The warning is found directed at those not part of the kingdom of God. They will be judged according to the law. There is no one righteous under the law except, says Paul, Jesus. If any are found to be separated and not clothed with Christ, they will be judged under God's law. They're going to be found guilty, with the consequence being separation from God for eternity. Either we are part of the kingdom of God, or we are in a lost status outside the kingdom of God. There's no middle ground. I will explain. When God created the heavens and the earth and all its inhabitants, God described it very good in Genesis 1. Then sin comes into creation through Adam and Eve. And creation has not been the same since it fell. It is no longer the very good creation that God made in Genesis. There is death. There is sin. There is sickness. There are all kinds of behavior that is against God's commandments. The world has fallen, and it is sinful. Now, Satan tells us that life is meant to be full of pleasure. It is, the, it is the right that human creatures set their own standards of right and wrong. And the world suggests being a good person, according to human standards, will get you to heaven. Because a good God cannot possibly condemn good human crea creation. 
These are among the arguments used so people find a suitable life in the world. They are led astray, failing to recognize that the decay and destruction and death that is all around them is an unnatural state. It is not part of the original creation in Genesis. Jesus came to save mankind from sin, not to destroy it. We see this manifest in the kingdom of God that comes with Jesus. Jesus sought out sinners, the sick, those that were rejected by the teachers of the law. He wants to take all of them with him, take them away from a hopeless situation in life, and introduce them to the kingdom of God that offers forgiveness, love, caring, and a life of hope based on the messianic salvation and his ultimate return to restore creation. So the Christian perspective is to recognize that we live in a time when the kingdom of God is already here. It came when Jesus arrives, as God intervenes in our history. It is the Holy Spirit who works through word and sacrament to reveal the kingdom of God. The people who belong to Christ are part of the kingdom of God, eagerly anticipating all the promises to be fulfilled when Jesus comes again. We live in a time when the messianic salvation is complete, and yet we also live in a time where we know there is more to be fulfilled on that last day. The, the kingdom of God is just not about individual salvation. It is also about this community, the community of saints, that collectively enables the church to share the love of Christ. We seek to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others through the Holy Spirit. So when the kingdom of God is revealed, the ways of the fallen world get rejected. We are a new creation through baptism. You can imagine for a moment your forehead at baptism, being stamped with the phrase, I am a servant of Jesus. By being a servant, we lose our identity in the world, but we gain an identity in Christ. Our lives become focused on Jesus and subject to his will and purpose. It is not what I want to do, but my calling in the kingdom of God that matters. As Matthew says, whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. In the kingdom of God, my life belongs to Jesus. He owns me. Some of you may recall the old kindergarten cop movie, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he says, Joel, you are mine now. He doesn't really say that. There's no Joel in the movie. But he tells the kindergarten kids, they're his. And so it is at our baptism that Jesus says, Joel, you are mine now. And you can substitute your first name for my first name and be confident in that. The point is people living in the kingdom of God are used for various purposes. The apostles had their calling. People who minister to the poor and needy, such as Stephen in the book of Acts, 
had their role. It is through our vocation that we serve, and that vocation can be in an occupational role, it can be a role in the church, it can be a role as a parent, father or mother, it can be in a role as son or daughter, or grandparent. Jesus sits at the right hand of God and is in control of his kingdom and all of creation. He is actively at work so that at the proper time, the restoration of all creation will happen when Jesus returns. This is the eschatological blessing to come in the kingdom of God. Earlier I made a reference that when Jesus intervenes in history, he brings with the kingdom of God, God's judgment. The sword that Jesus brings is a metaphor for the inevitable separation between those who believe in Christ and those who do not. And this division is so severe that Jesus uses this image of a sword. Some will hear Christ's call to faith and discipleship, and by God's gracious action through the gospel, they hear, they repent, and believe. Others hear the same call, but due to their own ingrained sin and stubbornness, they will reject the Christ who summons them to salvation. In the patriarchal culture of the first century, a believing son or daughter who refused an unbelieving father's anti-Christian direction could come under severe censure, punishment, and shame. At various times and places in the Roman Empire, to be a Christian and refuse to offer obedience to Caesar and the pagan gods was considered a seditious capital crime. Many Christians literally bore a cross or perished by fire or wild beast or gladiators. Jesus uses the family in our gospel text, the closest, most fundamental unit in human existence to show the impact Jesus' identity has. Son and father, daughter and mother, daughter-in-law and mother-in-law will become fundamentally separated from one another because one will confess Christ and the other will deny him. Both that confession of Christ and that denial of Christ will have eternal consequences. In our time, I know parents who grieve that their adult children don't attend church and that they've rejected Jesus and don't want to continue to even have a discussion <laughs> about it. I have also seen young people who have come to faith concerned that one or both of their parents are not yet in the kingdom of God. So Jesus brings this sword for the truth to be made plain. Jesus shows us through using family that it is impossible to live in harmony with a sinful, broken world. Even cherished relationships will be lost because of the challenge from unbelieving loved ones. Choose me and my ways rather than your Jesus and his ways. There is no middle ground because the issue of the identity of Jesus and faith in him. God loves us too much 
to leave us without this knowledge. Inside the kingdom of God is forgiveness of sins and being made into a new creation through Jesus. And it was Jesus who took the nails and the spear and the death on the cross and took on to himself all the sins, past, present, and future. He paid for them in order that our salvation would be won. And his resurrection brought us victory over sin, Satan, and death. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, ready for the hour to come to do all that he promises in the restoration of creation. We don't have to be good enough. Worthy enough. Or able enough to belong to the kingdom of God. It is given to us by the grace of God as a gift. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And we can be confident of that. We can be excited about that. No one can take away the righteousness that Jesus brings to you. And so we rejoice. Paradoxically, when a Christian suffers the loss of relationships and status in order to cling to this faith in Jesus, that believer will discover that losing their life in this way saves it. Give us the courage and strength to lose our life continually for the sake of